and we are live. Hey, everyone. So welcome back to the Mind Loon Show. So we got a fantastic guest today. I've been, I've been working hard to get him. Um, he's a very, very busy man, but very lucky to join uh, by author, uh, uh, investor, and uh, operating executive, uh, Bruce Cleveland, whose book I have right here, Traversing the Tra Traction Gap. You guys knew that I did this I think it was two years ago that I did this, Bruce, but I did it with like a crappy iPhone. This is before I even had any video equipment or anything at all, but it's made its way multiple times onto the show. I've, I've, I've talked about it and people have asked, they're like, well, are you going to be able to finally interview this guy? I was like, yeah. I was like, let me see. I was like, so somehow I've been able to get you on for, uh, for a Saturday night, which is perfect because our audience really likes that because those are the times when I usually get to have a drink with the author. So first, you know, before I kind of reveal what I'm drinking, tell us a little bit about what you're drinking tonight before we dive into, you know, everything about you in the book and more. So I'm a pretty big whiskey fan. And, um, and so whiskey, by whiskey, I mean the real whiskey, which is scotch. And, um, and so go. tonight I have a uh, Lagavulin 16 on menu. So um, I think, uh, I think it should, you know, maybe by the end of the show, it'll get even more interesting, but, um, but it's one of my favorite. It's very smoky. You know, the, the Isla, scotches whiskeys are pretty fantastic from um uh you know just just the smoky peaty taste and stuff by the way that's it, it for me it, it was acquired i didn't necessarily enter into the uh into sort into the whiskey um fandom it took me a while uh really? to sort of acquire that taste but that's it what i'm having tonight yeah i think it's definitely one of those things where it's uh it's it's an acquired thing right yeah. you know but it's, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Did you start, did you start right with Isla or? Oh God, no. I hated peaty scotches. Oh really? So, um, I started out actually thinking all scotches kind of tasted like, like something had been strained through an old dirty gym sock, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You know, that's kind of where I started in my twenties going, oh, I really do not like this. And, um, but over the years, the, um, you know, I, I, I actually, the, my go-to, the one that really kind of turned me, turned me on was Macallan. I oh, felt yeah. that, that was a pretty approachable whiskey. And, um, and kind of from there, I began to experiment with different ones from all around, um, from all around Scotland and grew, you know, I'm a big fan of all of them, you know, for all different reasons. Kind of like, if, you know, I like Merlot's, I like Cabernet's, I like, It just you know, depends what you're feeling, right? Yeah. And it's, um, I, I just, I find it to be a really, um, um, it, you know, the, the ones from Isla are very aromatic uh, and I think pretty, you know, pretty interesting. You can even, you, they even have ones that are non PD, like uh, from, um, uh, well, Brakludic is a, you know, I think is a really good one. That's a very good one. Not PD very much and flew over there a couple of years ago, um, spent some time when, you know, rainy, you know, it looked just like what you would expect Scotland to look like. Awesome. And um, I got a chance to sample a whole bunch of different, um, a whole bunch of uh, different distilleries there. And it was really, it was really great. That's awesome. That's all. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, because what people miss was that when I kind of clapped my hand when you said you were having Lagavulin. I don't know how to pronounce it, by the way. Is it La Gavulin? La Gavulin. Well, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, did you notice that in in Scotland, all of the um, the con the the vowels are pronounced the same way in Spanish, so it's A E E O U, just like. I didn't. I had no idea. No, that makes sense though. A, yeah, you want to take a run at trying to pronounce something, and I lived in Panama, Mexico, as an exchange student when I was a kid. So um, once I somebody told me that, I forgot where I saw that. I went. Oh, I have a better shot at trying to pronounce yeah. this stuff if I just remember that. I, that makes a lot of sense. Well, it's yeah, no, it's funny. So I love Isla and Lagavulin is is one of my favorites, right? And Lafroy is great, but just you know, it's a little it's a little too much. So uh recently I was gonna get another another Lagavulin, but I, I decided like, let me try something a little bit different. I've had Ardberg before. Uh -huh. This one I did not know. So I'm about to crack open. This Ardberg, the Cory 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 Vrecken, Cory Vrecken, and and here's the interesting thing: Cory Vrecken is apparently a whirlpool. So this is like their this is how they describe it: the ultimate ILA single malt. But the thing that caught me was in this small text down here. This is the three words. The first word they use to describe a Scotch from ILA is turbulent. 
I feel like Isla scotches are turbulent to begin with. Yeah. But the fact that they they said from a marketing purpose, they're like, no, this is this is a turbulent. So I had to get this. But apparently what they did was they aged this in French, uh, French, French cast. Yeah. And the difference between French and American so apparently, apparently with the French, they're really high in tannins. So if you screw it up, the tannins just dry out the scotch and you end up with like a really big burst of flavor, but that's it. There's no, there's no uh, uh, like, like lasting taste or, or, or timing to it. But if you do it the right way, it's just really, really amazing. So that's what I got. Um, and I'm also going to uh, <laughs> give choice. you a good laugh. I've been to that distillery too. What's that? Good choice. I've been to that distillery as well. Yeah, I, I've never been to any of these. I hope to. What I didn't know is some of the history of Arbor because I always get curious to look it up. So apparently they were doing really bad. They almost shut down in the 80s. But Glenn Morganzi uh, bought them and they came up with like the packaging here, the green bottle. And from a marketing perspective, that's what kind of saved them in the 90s. But here's the thing that you're going to kind of get a kick out of. Do you know, have you heard of Richard, Sir Richard Pattison? No, I don't. So he, have... he's like the, uh, this Scotch connoisseur. He has this big mustache and everything from Scotland. So this is how you're supposed to, like, he, he says you have to, you know, prepare Scotch. So you put just a little bit in the, in the, in the glass, right? You don't know where the glass has been. You give it a little whirl and you throw some over your shoulder, but it's okay. I got carpet behind me. It's a library. So it should smell like Scotch. Absolutely. So it's completely okay. So light a cigar in there too. I'm sure your wife would love that. (laughs) No, it's Valentine's day tomorrow. So I got to tread lightly. She's already letting me like do this podcast and get, you know, have a few drinks, like, you know, so I have to go little by little. So, but yeah, so Cheers, by the way. Cheers. 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 Delicious. Oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. I mean, and the other thing, I, I'll send you this video. For, for those of you who are watching, I, I might leave it in the comments. The other things he says is that when, before you put your water, you got to get to know Scott. You got to go and go, hello. How are you? Very well. Thank you very much. And then you, you've gotten adjusted to it. It's really an obscure and, and peculiar way of doing it, but I'll tell you, it works. I, I enjoy it. So I found also, um, so I also got an eyedropper from, um, from there. And, um, and so I began to experiment with different drops, you know, and you can really taste a dramatic difference between one, two, three, or more drops of water. That's what I need to do. The one, the, the thing that I saw, and I just, I, I, should, I was going to do it today, but but sometimes it just gets a little bit messy is they, they use like a teaspoon or a tablespoon just to just to measure. It. It's a lot better than like supporty and like that. But, you know, it, it, it all works. It works. It's all good. It works. It's all good. So, Bruce, before we like jump into talking shop, I mean, let me ask you a question that, you know, most people usually don't get to hear from you, which is like, what's your story? Like, who is Bruce Cleveland? Like, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Like, what what's that? What's that story look like? I'm nobody from nowhere. I'm exactly what the American dream is all about. My grandparents came from what was called Yugoslavia, um, which is effectively now a, a several, well, it was several countries and has now been broken into several countries, um, specifically um, Czechoslovakia and Serbia, which is kind of interesting. So the, um, uh, my parents were teachers in Petaluma and uh, public school teachers. And I, um, again, you know, no, um, you know, nothing, nothing that you would say, gee, this would be notable, Mm -hmm. except um, a work ethic, which was to put your all into academics, uh, put your all into, I I was into sports. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I found myself at the ripe old age, I think it was fifth grade of wanting to go to an, to a military academy. And it was because of boys life I had read in there about West Point. Classic. So uh, Classic. I read that and I said, I'm going to West Point. My mom and dad both said, you know, it's it's kind of hard to get in there. Um, you might want to have some safety schools. And I said, well, I got Stanford and a couple others as my safety school. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you might want to think about something else. Yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, um, I, I did lots of things. I mean, I, I went off, I became an exchange student. I lived in Panama, Mexico. I went to school there, um, speech and debate. Um, I didn't do all this just to get in the academies, by the way. I did this because they were interesting to me. And, um, you know, I was a typical young boy. I had a paper route. I did, yeah, I mean, young American boy. Um, 
but I found myself in in a pretty good position with with uh, interviewing uh, for a variety of different academies. I got into several of them, and I chose to get in go into West Point. The interesting part is I actually left before the end of my first year, and I left for a couple of reasons. You know, if I'm honest with it, I left one because um, I wasn't sure that's really a military career was what I wanted after I got in. Number two, uh, I was really good in computer science. And that was something I'd never been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And at the time, computer science really wasn't, wasn't something you could study. Today, you could study lots of different things at the academies. They're fantastic. Um, but back then, you could study anything you wanted as long as, long as it was engineering. And um, I was decent at, at engineering, but I was really good in computer science. And I thought, well, you know, I think I, I'm wasting a spot here for um, that somebody else could take that wants to be a career military officer. And, um, and you know, plus I think there was also a hint of homesickness in there, you mm -hmm. know, being away. And, um, and I entered when I was quite young, I was 17, because um, I graduated early from, from high school. So anyway, the net of all that was I left, much to my dad's chagrin um, and much to my mom's delight. So, um, Got it. Uh, my mom was not a fan of me going to the <laughs> military academy. So um, anyway, I came back, didn't really know really what I wanted to do necessarily. I went to, um, I ended up going to Sac State because Sacramento State in California, because oh. that's what I could afford to do. That's what, what my parents could afford to, to put me through. And honestly, I didn't put a lot of, of effort into that. I mean, I, I look back, I go, I could have crushed my grades and stuff. And I really didn't. I mean, I kind of phoned it in to be quite frank. Um, and, um, and so, but I, what I did do is I ended up uh, finding the, the, the gal that, that um, and who I decided would be my life partner and we got married and we've been married for 40 some odd years now. So I think I probably chose okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And a uh, couple, couple, couple children, couple daughters. Um, one just turned 40 this last week. Uh, my younger daughter is. You have, uh, a, you have a daughter that's forty years old. I do, and what? I have five grandchildren. <laughs> so, um, from nine down to down to three, four. Only because you're a man, I have to ask you. Like, how? Wait, how old are you, though, Bruce? I'm I'm sixty two. You with all yeah, you don't look like you're sixty two at all. <laughs> that kind of cat caught me a little bit off guard. Wow, and you have a daughter that's four. I was expecting here like I have a daughter who's like about to enter college or something. Wow, that's 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 amazing. Well, congratulations. I mean, that's great to be happy father and happy granddad too. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm very you know very fortunate to have found the right person to be with. My kids and grandkids are phenomenal, and um, I enjoy being with them. And you know, to on, honestly, you know, my 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 tech career, I I don't think I could have done it without my wife. You know, it's been a pretty challenging. Um, you know, it's now it's almost 40 years so it's you know there it's it all looks good on paper <laughs> it all looks like it was easy um i can but assure I'll, you it wasn't and yeah. uh, as we get into more around you know what i'm currently doing i can assure you that um you know in your 60s doing these startups um is a little more challenging than when you're in your 20s so. i mean you know look i'm th i'm turning 35 this year and it's you know, <laughs> sometimes I joke with people depending on what they're doing in, in, in startups. And I'm like, oh, man, that's that's like a, a young man's or young woman's like game right there. Like being, you know, at least for me, I was in med devices for a while. So like doing clinical sales is really, really rough and not easy is with the travel yeah. and stuff. But, you know, there's I, I got to tell you for how absolutely brutally painful and and, and uh, tough it is and frustrating it is. It's like once once you're in it, if you got the bug, like you can't, you can't get out. It's just, it's just who you are, you know? And, and one of my great men, my late mentors who passed away a couple of years ago, you know, he told me, he's like, you know, I'm a startup guy. He's like, I like to find mountains and, and build paths over those mountains and then go on to the next mountain. He's like, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not interested in sticking around long-term, you know, when the company becomes like a billion dollar company or anything. Yeah. And I am starting to really appreciate like what that means now, because I'm, I'm on to my, I think, fourth or fifth startup, you know, which is still like really, really early and young, you know, so. But, Absolutely. But yeah, I think it's great experience that'll lead, you know, into what your next things will do. Yeah, t t tell us a little bit about, I mean, there's a lot of young people who listen to this and they, I think they, they, they miss the value of having 
a great partner and spouse. You know, I'm lucky I got married to a wonderful lady. Uh, she, so my mother's Turkish. So I'm a first generation American. So I have a profound respect for immigrants. Um, and my wife is an immigrant. So I always tell her, I'm like, you know, our, our kids are going to be tough as nails because, you know, while I'm, I'm a first generation American, I'm pretty tough. My wife's even more tougher. And I always <laughs> tell people, it's like, I was like, my, my wife makes sure that, that I don't spend our money on, 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 on meaningless bullshit that we don't need. <laughs> like I can't buy her anything these days, you know, but what, what kind of, what kind of, uh, 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 effect did that have on you? Like, uh, as a young entrepreneur, like having a part, a great partner. Well, I think, you know, the problem is that um, not everything is an IPO day, you know, and so, um, in fact, 99.999% of those days are not IPO days. Um, and after the IPO, they're not IPO days. There's just a lot of hard work, you know, it's just like Olympic athletes, you know, they look at or professional athletes, you don't see all of the, the, the pain and agony and, and mental fortitude that's required to show up and work 15 hours a day, you know, up seven days a week. And, and, and when most things are failing and blowing up in your face, <laughs> you got to go to bed and wake up with a smile on your face the next day. Yeah. And especially if you're leading a team, I mean, you, yeah. can, you, wanna, you know, I, one thing I really appreciate from the military academies is that you know, the, this concept of leadership, you earn leadership. It's not something that's appointed to you. Yep. Um, absolutely. And different people at different ranks are, are leaders. I mean, you can be a, a, you know, you could be a private and be a phenomenal leader. You don't have to be a general officer. In fact, a lot of general officers, I would say, if you asked a number of people aren't really great leaders um, in many cases, they may be brilliant, but in many cases, they may not be people who they're under their command, who would say that they are great leaders. We know many who are, but, um, but the point of the matter is that you have to earn that position. You have to get people to believe in what you believe. You have to, um, you have to just suck it up when things are hard. And, um, you know, I don't always do the perfect job of this, but it's something in the back of my mind at all times when I know that we're asked to do a mission impossible which has happened over, we can talk about, you know, kind of the companies I've worked for um, and the people who I've worked for. Uh, Mission Impossible is, is sort of the name of the game. And you got to go back to your team and they're tired and they're not sure they can get it done. And you have to sit there in front of them and go, we're going to get it done. And here's how we're going to do it. Even though at nighttime at 3 a.m. in the morning, you wake up and you go, I have no freaking idea how we're going to get this done. <laughs> those, 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 those middle of night nights, but so I have a, I, I came up with somewhat of a trick because you got to get some sleep. And for me, you know, I try to have good sleep hygiene, but I can't help but like think about things while I'm laying in bed, but some, something clicked this week. And I told my wife, I'm like, this is such, it was such a brilliant idea. I somehow convinced myself when I was trying to go to bed and I was thinking about things that I said, well, you know, when, when I wake up tomorrow, cause I usually wake up around, around five. I said, when I wake up tomorrow, I can spend some time laying in bed thinking about these ideas. I said, but I should just go to bed. For some reason that worked. And I woke up the next morning at like 445. And I was like, oh, good. Like I was going to wake up anyway. So now I can lay in bed and think about these things instead of doing it right before I go to bed. And it, and it takes like two hours to go to bed. You know? Yeah. No, that's hard. I mean, I um, somebody, I, I forgot who it was, said, you know, the way that if you want to try to... Um, you know, in the military, you only get certain amounts of sleep. So your job is to clear your mind and just think of nothing. And that usually allows you to fall back to sleep. The way I think about nothing is I have a, you know, I have pen and paper or pen and a pad right near, near me. And if for some reason I wake up, I write down whatever it is, then I know I can fall asleep and not worry about in the morning that I will have forgotten what it is that I was trying to that's Thank a good you. idea. I, I really, that's actually not a bad idea at all. Cause it's almost like you're getting it. You're just getting, getting it out of your head. I sort of did something similar. Like many years ago, I was going through a really rough patch in my life. And I realized that one way to kind of get out like a lot of negative and just meaningless self-talk in my head was just to kind of vomit it on a piece of paper, get it out of my head. And I just throw the piece of paper away. And then that seemed to work, but that's actually not a bad idea. So you just, do you, do you have like a framework? Oh, that is the most tech Silicon Valley question. I, I, I just have to call myself. See, like I'm barely uh, halfway through my drink. I'm calling myself. A, <laughs> is there a framework? But when you do it, do you just do it to get the ideas out of your head? Do you have a certain way of doing it? You know? 
it's really simple. I mean, I just literally write down light items. In fact, the management system I use, I mean, I, we do use a, uh, um, a Kanban uh, at, for, for, for our marketing team where we and document everything we're going to get done. But and for those, that, for those who are not familiar with Kanban, can you, can you explain that? Yeah, so this is a product from Atlassian called Jira. And it, um, it's basically for engineers to be able to manage projects, but you can use it for a lot of different things. I think it's great for marketing personally, to be honest. We, um, we, we um, uh, perturbed its, <laughs> its, its outcome uh, for our purposes, which is basically um, everybody in our organization every day begins the morning by kind of documenting the things they're gonna get done or they would like to get done. And then they begin to move. You, it's it's a it's a card based metaphor for user interface. So you, all you do is you you type in what it is you think you want to get done, and then as you get it done, you move it. You basically drag it into another column. And we have four columns. It's basically to do and in process and you know CEO review and then and then completed. So it's real simple, very basic. And then we also use this as a performance management system. So at night we we everything has been completed, we pick up in a product from Microsoft called Power BI, and we write uh, this, this uh, um, we've written a report that picks up everything that everybody's doing in marketing. In fact, we use this across the company oh, as wow. a high performance management system for the entire organization. Our team, because the way I constructed my digital marketing group is maybe different than others, um, because I come from the product side of the world, uh, I hired engineers. <laughs> and so digital marketing, is we are engine you know it's an engineering team and so we i don't need to rely upon it or on engineering or product or anybody we write our own stuff so we designed the system we wrote the power bi reports and then we also helped other teams in finance and hr and others we designed it for them as well and so the ceo gets a full holistic picture of everything that's going on in the company work, you know, performance, and especially with COVID where everybody's working remote or many people are. You have this to have those systems way, in place. Yeah. Yeah. It's a way for us to one document ourselves. So, you know, what are we doing? What are we getting done? What's a problem? And then he can see across the company, like, oh, we've got some issues in engineering or their issues in finance or whatever they are. And it, it allows us to be able to, to work on these things. So, Bringing it back to you know what what I do, um, that's too complicated at 3 a.m. in the morning. I just basically write it down on my little pad. It's really simple, very you know the, <laughs> my my management system, very simple line items that I write down, and then I transfer those into the into the Kanban in the morning, and um, it it's proven to be quite effective. Yeah, and I think well, I feel that. So here's here's so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, riff a little bit on something something you said. So there's since coming out here to the valley, like I, I realize like there's 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 a lot of different types of marketers, but there's there's two really like stereotypical types. They're the brand type marketers where they have absolutely no concept of of process, how to look at data or anything, but they're really into brand, right? And and and, and storytelling, which is good. The other side, which I'm seeing a lot of now that I'm, I'm, I'm head, of, head of growth for, for a company, which are coming from the engineering world where they're very process driven. They know how to look at data, but they often over engineer things and they just focus so much on experimentation and they don't know how to copyright or do anything. Um, but if I had to pick between the two, I feel like the, the, the latter that I just mentioned, the engineering types is going to be more valuable because at least if there's a process to it, you can at least manage and measure it. If there isn't one, it's kind of like, and I think, you know, in some industry, like I, I talk about a lot of this in med device, it's more on the brand and product marketing side where they don't know how to put processes and measure things appropriately. And as a result, their, you know, their, their ability to translate marketing activities to ROIs is pretty bad. You know, at least that's been my experience. You know, I think this is kind of a Deion Sanders moment. I think it's both. What, you know? a, hell, what a hell of an analogy. <laughs> what, an, what an analogy i love it and he, i don't know if i i didn't i don't think i ever told you so i'm from texas so i definitely appreciate that <laughs> i think you have to i mean the really great thing because remember uh, well we haven't really talked about sort of what i've done but the um uh i i spent 15 years in venture um after leaving an operating role where i was the chief, i ended up finally being the chief product officer for civil systems but um the um digital marketing didn't exist really um, 
back it, when I, in 2005. Well, I think that back then, and even a few years after that, digital marketing was like, oh, that's a social media thing. Like, can we just get an intern to do that? So let's let's backtrack a little bit, because I know you had spent time, you cut your teeth, I think, early on at Apple, and then went over to Siebel Systems. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, what are the things that did, that you learned that, I think that Siebel Systems was kind of like your first big break uh, as an exec, correct? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just, you know, shorten truth I start out actually with AT&T as an engineer as a network engineer designing um, local area networks for like the prisons of California <laughs> I, the incident Quentin but uh, designing something called an SS7 which is a signaling type system for the that's just what they use for alarms or whatever anyway the point of all that was I got I got introduced to this very young guy and a company that was a small private company on Sand Hill Road called Oracle um, there might be there might have been 80 100 people in the company you know maybe maybe 10 million in revenue I, I forget exactly this was 1984 85 and um, and so I went to work for this guy named Tom Siebel as his sales engineer I decided to leave um, to leave at t to go do this to see if I thought relational databases was a pretty interesting category and uh, so I joined Tom and uh, and then for some reason he didn't fire me and he got kept getting promoted, so he dragged me along. I ended up building the um, back then. Oracle was, was um, divided into and run by and organized by operating systems. VMS from DEC Digital Equipment Corporation was the big, hot, great mini computer operating system of the day, and that's where most of the revenue was being driven into the company. And I had some what Larry would have called and did call a pathetic operating system called Unix. So um, I, I was the one that, uh, that was running that group, product line marketing. And, uh, and so, you know, as we all know, that pathetic thing ended up becoming the thing. But, uh, but at the, you know, I was probably 24, 25 years old doing that, working for Tom. And, uh, and so we, we went public uh, in, I think it was 1985, 86, somewhere, somewhere around there. I was there before we were public. I was there, I had a little loose IQ. And, uh, and so I got, I got brought along to do that. From there, I went to, I went to Apple um, for five years, five, five years after that, I went to Apple. And what, and, what year uh, was that? That probably was like 91. Um, so is that- it was, at, it was uh, Spindler was the CEO. Steve yeah, there we go. hadn't returned yet. And this is, these were the really dreary days of Apple. I was going to say, those are the dog years. Yeah, terrible. You know, um, everybody could build, you know, the way you had power was you had a hardware system, you know, you had a Quadra or you had some kind of Mac that you built and, and the different people, different C, the different uh, VPs competed based upon. There was just a bunch of, there was, there was a bunch of projects going on. I think that was like the first thing that Jobs did was he came and he just, he, he cut a lot of fat off, right? That's right. And I, I was building operating system stuff. So I wasn't doing, I wasn't the guy building consumer stuff. I was building um, this object oriented operating system that was going to replace the mac os uh, back then it was it was called pink and blue and it was built huh. off pink was the talent um effort that apple invested in along with ibm and novell so um a long story short is I, I built that we also my group built um we took the macintosh operating system and poured it on top of unix and a bunch of other stuff to base so you could run your mac apps on a sun Apollo, all these different systems that probably people listening here have no idea who these companies are. But um, right, but <laughs> it doesn't no, matter. But, but this no, but it, it does matter. This 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 is the thing. So me me, I mean, uh, I didn't mention this to you earlier. So me uh, bef uh, before like coming into tech, I was actually in medical school uh, in mm. Texas, and I, and I dropped out. And in medicine, like the thing that you, if you talk to surgeons, any physician. Aside from really knowing their craft, they know their history really, really well. And when I came into uh, into the, like sales marketing, especially marketing, I would ask people, I'm like, well, who are the great marketers? Well, what are the foundational books? And a lot of people, they're like, I, I don't know. And I'm like, well, how the hell do you not know? Like, how do you not know your own history? So I appreciate what you're telling me. So keep keep going. All right. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to bore everybody here. This is, uh, uh, but the journey here, I think, is relevant because it'll it'll explain and inform the opinions that I've created over the years, whether they're right or wrong, they're, they're, they're what are the foundational principles of what I learned. I was very fortunate to work with people who are now iconic um, technology executives, not of this generation, you know, but I think of the previous generation. 
Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see whether C3 AI is a, is a, this generation or not. But the um, the net of it was, um, I got the opportunity to to learn. You know, sort of, you know, built. I ran an engineering division at Apple. I didn't run a um, after Oracle. And um, and then in 1996, in April of 96. Tom Siebel called me up and said, hey, I think we got this company. It seems to be working. You know, it looks like it has some shred of promise. At that time, Apple was in complete tatters. And um, I decided I'm not going to hang around for this, you know, what I <laughs> shit show. So, so I, um, I, I joined Tom and he says, you're going to be VP of corporate marketing. You're going to work for my co-founder, Pat House, who I'd worked with at Oracle, by the way. By the way, she's a phenom. People don't know. She's, she's. Cheryl before Cheryl. I mean, four for the leather powerhouse. You you would know her when she walks into a room. So Pat is the secret sauce of of Siebel, and I think Tom would say that as well. So I joined Siebel <coughs> in um, April '96. Went public in June of '96. Um, very very little revenue. This is back when you could do that. And um, head of corporate marketing, something I'd never done before. And my mentor was really Pat. I mean, I knew a lot about engineering and product marketing and product management. I knew crap all about corporate marketing. And, and just for, for context, for those who, who are outside of Valley, can you just kind of uh, let everybody know like what Siebel Systems was known for? Yeah. So when we started Siebel, when I joined, we did two or three million. And four years later, we were two billion in revenue, almost 50 billion in valuation. Fastest, still the fastest growing company in US history. We created CRM. Salesforce did not create CRM. They, they did a really interesting spin off of that, which is they recreated CRM in cloud, right? In what we now know as cloud, but in the SaaS right. business model. That exactly. is Mark's contribution. Yeah. We did not invent CRM. I'm so, so you will be very happy to, to, to hear this because I was just talking about this when I was, and we'll get into this in a moment. When I was talking about category creation, I mentioned, you know, Salesforce in the past. And I said, you know, their thing was like the no software. It was a SaaS. It wasn't CRM, right? It's kind of no. like, it's like Facebook, like, you know, made social media what it is today, but Facebook did not invent social media, right? But anyway, keep, 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 keep going, please. Well, you know, I mean, the way I would look at it, because, um, you know, from a, a military background, my West Point background, you know, you study history, if you don't want to repeat it. And, uh, and so, you know, I think the Romans basically rewrote history, right? Uh, they wiped out entire civilizations, and they basically installed their own history. So um, that's kind of what happened. We, we, we sold the company, we sold Siebel in um, actually September 12, 2005 was the, uh, the day of the definitive agreement, but it became oh, wow. in, in February of 2006. And so um, once we once we left, all of us left. Oracle acquired it, um, leaving a big vacuum for Mark uh, and Salesforce. You know, they they basically rewrote history. I mean, I once taught a class at INSEAD, um, uh, and I asked this was maybe even six seven years ago, and I said, "How many people here know who Siebel Systems is?" And I mean, maybe like three or four people in the class. Well, sorry, we sold the company. Nobody knows what it is, and the next people come along and. And that's, you know, that's the, unfor that's the unfortunate side effect of, of um, you know, just like PeopleSoft, you know, people probably don't even know who PeopleSoft is, but they certainly know who Workday is. And Workday is basically the founders of PeopleSoft. It's just done in the cloud. So anyway, the net of all this is, um, you know, we, we sold the company. Um, I, I did, over the 10 years period of time I was there, I held a number of roles. I, um, I did corporate marketing. And then Tom asked me to go build an alliance program. And there's actually a Harvard case study on the program we built, uh, which I'm pretty proud of. And we ended up with almost a thousand different uh, partners and um, you know about a billion in revenue that we were generating through that program. So I'm, I'm, I am very proud of that, that uh, accomplishment. And then eventually, um, I actually went sailing for two years. I, took, I retired, thought I would never work. <laughs> I lived in the Caribbean on, on my sailboat. That's a different story. And, um, I came back and then I took over uh, all products for the company as the chief product officer and did that for a few years until we sold it. Um, when we sold the company to Oracle, I really didn't want to go back to Oracle. So it, I mean, it was like 100,000 people, 150,000 people. And when I had left, you know, there was a lot fewer than about maybe 800 or 1,000 people in the company. So I didn't want to go back. And I said, I would try my hand at venture capital. I didn't know crap all about venture capital. 
Now here's an interesting Silicon Valley story. So I entered, I went, and there are several different groups that were interested in talking to me and uh, I went and met with them and some were interested in venture capital firms and some were interested in me taking over one of their companies, but I kind of wanted to try something different. I had already done a lot of that. And I said, okay, I want to do, I want to do venture. I don't know anything about it. So a very small firm, which had actually done well, um, I decided I would join. And the name of the firm is Interwest Partners. Now they're, um, they're pretty much, that's a firm that the, the partners have all kind of gotten older and transitioned or whatever. Half life sciences, life sciences, by the way. So ah. I'm very familiar with med devices. Um, oh, great. But, but so you know, you know, you know my pain when I talk about marketing and medical devices. Oh yeah. I mean, you, you've got a two phase problem. You've got not only um, you, you have an FDA problem and then you have a commerciality problem. So yeah. anyway, the net of it is this firm was located in the same, very same small offices that Oracle was located in. Really? So when, I came, when I joined them, I was back in the same damn offices at 2710 Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park as I had joined in 1985. So that's- How, how you know, weird was that? Was Silicon that Silicon Valley trip. I was a lot more wrinkled, you know, <laughs> the trees were a lot taller, um, but the same damn office. <clears throat> and so I decided to hang my shingle out because, you know, you're, you are kind of, it's a, sort of a lone, it's called like, t it's like tennis. You know, there's a t there are team points that's called the fund, you know, that you got to score on, but it's individual accomplishments that, that generate the returns for the fund. <clears throat> so I decided I would hang my shingle out doing SAS. Why? Because I built the SAS division inside of, of um, Siebel and I was quite familiar with all the issues associated with it. So one of the things on my drawing board as the chief product officer of the company that I never got to do, but I definitely wanted to do, was um, completely transform the role of, of the chief marketing officer. I wanted to turn them in from party planners into <laughs> revenue generators. Exactly. So exactly. That, that begat, a, um, a month or so in, I ran into three people and an idea. Um, no code, no customers, maybe a dog, I have no idea, um, but an idea that, and we had a mind meld about what they wanted to do and what I thought would work. And that company was Marketo. And wow. so um, I was the first investor along with my partner from um, uh, Interwest, Doug Pepper, great guy, he's now at Iconic. Um, um, he and I, we invested together and uh, even Doug said, he goes, I never would have invested in these guys if you hadn't said this is something that we ought to do. But I was convicted in, in my, my feeling that marketing was ripe for an overhaul. And so um, I invested in Marketo. Um, I mean, we generated hundreds of millions of dollars for our, our LPs. You know, I have no, I could take no credit for the work that Phil Fernandez, uh, John Miller, and Dave Morandi, the three founders, I can make no credit for that. Um, I can only take credit for recognizing talent. And so um, I was able to invest in them and uh, they did a phenomenal job, I think, revolutionizing the way that we think about marketing. And I went on to invest in other things like um, uh, uh, work, work, Workday as, um, as, a, as a, most of my stuff were, most of my investments were mostly ideas. Some mm -hmm. were ongoing, Workday was already going, but um, most were just concepts. Velocity, just acquired by Salesforce, a company called Doximity, LinkedIn for position. Oh, Doximity, yeah, yeah. How yeah. much, um, you know, when you, I, I feel like um, venture is, is such a whimsical and interesting world. Um, and it's, it's it, it, like, I feel like on the surface, there seems like a, a way to codify it but then it, it becomes more, more like an art. Like it just depends on who, who you're talking to and just how they look at investments, and everything. For, so for you, like how much of it was you were looking for a really good idea to invest in and how much of it was you wanted like really talented people that you knew that like these people, if they don't make something out of this, it'll be the next thing. You know, how, how do you look at your investments? So, so this is kind of my bias on venture. I don't think that mo most venture capitalists are not very venturous. Um, I agree. <laughs> them, and, and, know, and before you say anything, I have to, I have to, <laughs> I, I knew, I told myself, I said, you shouldn't ask him this because you just, you don't know that well, but I, I'm a scotch in. So I have to ask this. All right. <laughs> so you were at, you were at Wild, Wildcat Ventures as a partner, and then you were there for a few years and then you left and now you're, you're, you're CMO at, C, uh, at, at uh, C3 AI. Yeah. C3 AI, right? Yeah. 
when I saw that happening, it reminded me kind of like when Michael Jordan went and played baseball for a little bit and then he got restless and was like, screw this, I got to go back into basketball. I had this feeling, and again, if I'm completely wrong, just call me out. You just got restless and you're like, this this VC thing is 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 not for me. I need to go back to being an operator and I need to go back into into the into the start world. Is am I right in some way about that? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly how it happened, but there there was definitely a year or two run up to making that decision. Um I I had left Interwest after doing these these investments. I learned a lot from them, 10 years. Um, really good, you know, the, the partnership. I, I learned around the business, right? The business of venture capital um, from working with that team. Um, I always, I was kind of the lone wolf, you know, because I don't have an MBA from Harvard. Um, I don't look, you know, the thing I talk about in my book is that when I invest, there is no market typically that you can't use your, your degree from Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, you know, Sloan, whatever, because there's nothing to evaluate. You cannot apply discounting factors. They're not um, spreadsheet companies. <laughs> that's right. They are all, they are PowerPoint. I invest in PowerPoint companies. I don't invest in spreadsheet companies. <laughs> and so uh, I have, I, that's one of the issues I have. And in the book, I talk about this, um, where I, I have, um, I, I have kind of a, a breaking of the, of the ways, you know, I didn't come the, our firm Interwest and then Wildcat is a new one. We don't have people knocking on our door like Andreessen or, um, or Sequoia or Axel or those, or those great iconic firms. So what do you have to do? you got to, you have to build a brand, right? You got to, you have to do all those things. And I thought, you know, um, I'm going to invest before the, before them, and I'm going to invest before them because I think I've built products. I know these markets. Most of these these uh, GPs have never built a product. They've never built a company. That's not true at Andreessen. At Andreessen, a lot of their partners are actually former operating people, and they're quite good at it. So um, yeah, you know, like a Andrew Chen, who who really I think he coined and he didn't he didn't start the idea of growth, but he definitely popularized it with his uh, like. The chief growth officer is a new CMO, but yeah, like he's an operator. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's literally what we need more of those people in venture, and that's why I always, I always kind of, I, I, I kind of, you know, look down and hold my head when I go, don't go into venture, go become an operating executive, build a billion dollar company, then go into venture because then you can help entrepreneurs. Exactly. If you've never done anything, you know, you graduated from with your great MBA. By the way, I'm not just discounting your MBA. I Hey, I'm, no, no, I'm right there with you. I don't have an MBA. And in a weird way, I kind of, like, I've had this argument with my wife. I kind of don't want to get one because I feel like, you know, people, are, especially from my hometown, you know, I, as I advance in my career and I have a lot, a long ways to go, they at least seem into like, man, this guy did something. He didn't have like a fancy MBA. I feel like the moment I get that, it's kind of like, oh, well, yeah, of course, like he got, he, he's from Harvard or Stanford. So but the firm, the, the iconic firms want you to have gone there because they, they market that to the limited partners. They say, we have the smartest people on the planet working for us. You know, they're, they, they went to Harvard, Stanford. And by the way, those are great schools, you know. Very great. I, you know, if I had an MBA. So anybody who has that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but Bruce, tell me, tell me this. In my opinion, or not, forget my opinion. What do you think is more marketable? You have an MBA from a top, top tier school, like a Stanford or Harvard, which is great. Or you can say, yeah, I was employee number five or six, and we built this billion dollar company that created this entire category. Yeah, I would say the latter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the smart limited partners who are investing in, in the GPs, you know, I think they think that way. But there's a lot of people who look at other aspects of a partnership that I think are, um, are going to end up being problematic. Um, if you're not looking at performance uh, and the ability for that person, the, the GPs themselves, their ability to build to spot a phenomenally large market, build a phenomenally great product, and to engineer a market around it. If you're not looking at just those characteristics, I think you're going to be disappointed in the outcome. At the end, you have to generate significant returns. But the way I look at it is that I am blind to everything but market size and is this team capable of engineering a market? And when I talk about this in the book, which is engineering a market is category creation, thought leadership, the ability to generate 
unique vocabulary, vernacular around the category, installing yourself into that, and then your basic you know, the basic blocking and tackling, which is positioning and messaging and storytelling. If you can't, if, if that team is not capable of doing that, if it's purely a scientific, and now, by the way, this is different than biotech and, and, uh, and yeah. medtech, but um, if you can't do that, um, for the most part, it is highly unlikely that your company is going to become one of the very, very few companies that is going to go on to become a multi-billion dollar outcome. And so yeah. I remove all those other elements. And I know that, you know, again, I know I don't fit into sort of today's, you know, sort of the way in which people want to characterize it. But no, I no, I'll, let me, I'll, 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 yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And look, I think it's good. I, I rail hard against that stuff. Um, again, because maybe, maybe because of my background, you know, so my, again, first generation of American, my parents are Middle East, and dad's from Iraq, mom's from Turkey, my wife's an immigrant, I'm brown. So those things, like, I don't care about them. It's, 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 it's fluff, it's meaningless, it's, it's very empty. I think it's good when we recognize and say, hey, like, it's good for us to kind of like invest in these kind of things. That's great. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the market, the rest of the world doesn't give a shit about these things. It really does not. You know, no. and I think if you build the right company, then these things will come. And then as you get more successful, when you grow, like, like when you're at a point, maybe not as big as sales, but when you get to a certain point, you're bigger, then you can start worrying about these things. But at the end of the day, what you have to worry about is like, are we creating something that's valuable to a market that actually exists? And if it doesn't exist, can we create one and own it? Like these, like you have to answer these questions before this other, other stuff. You know, so you know what you're, I, I think this is where um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs applies to corporations. So Maslow's that's said, a really good way to put it. Hold on, I'm gonna open my window. Keep going. Sorry. All right. So I think what you would, you know, the way that Maslow would talk about it, the, the very basic is survival, right? That's a startup survival. Yeah. Find exactly. The best people possible, who, wherever they come from, whatever you know, ethnicity, gender, political, I don't care. Yeah. Find that team, build that. When you get to be a sales force, now you are at actualization. Now, what does the board look like? How can we shape the board to make sure that it is, you know, that we are, um, that, you know, that we are inclusive and diverse. Yeah. And then also, how do we make sure that we are a social enterprise? How are we not just doing well, but we're, we are doing well by our community and our country and our world. Those are first world order problems. But if you make the mistake and you try to start at self-actualization instead of worried about being in survival, you are making a mistake. And I look at startups as survival. Okay. I, every time they start, you're in survival. And yeah. so you need to figure out how do you move up you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I didn't write about that in the book, but effectively that's what I was just saying, I think you just, I think you just came up with your next book right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll write the forward. <laughs> no, but, but I think you're, I think you're absolutely correct. And again, I think these things are, are, are definitely, they're, they're important, no doubt. But at the end of the day, I'm, you know, sometimes these things can be just purely distractions. Now I think, and again, me being here in the Valley, I, I, I've been more open-minded where I'm like, you know what? I need to, I need to sort of see, I think I, I can't take anybody seriously who disagrees with a point of view and yet they're not able to articulate the point of view they disagree with well. So my thing is like, okay, let me understand that point of view. So from my perspective, how I try and sort of make, make, a, make things better in that regard. When I, let's say hire, I try and get resumes without like the first, you know, without the names on there right? That's, That's the way idea. it's a little bit more objective. Right? It's fine. Yeah. And then I try again, being, you know, a former medical student and somebody who's really into persuasion and marketing, I'm aware of my own biases. So if I see a guy who happens to kind of look like me, sound like me, have a name like me, I know for a fact that I'm at a much higher level of getting persuaded to liking this person. So at least I'm conscious about it. I think being conscious about it and getting educated is fine. But then like you, I, sometimes I feel like startups, which at when you're a startup and you've been given some money by some angel investors, you have a responsibility to take that and say, hey, these people gave us money for something that doesn't even exist. We have to make this work. That's where all your energy should be focused on. We got to be talking to customers. We got to be validating things. We got to be trying things because all your energy is finite. That's where it should be going. And it's going to be distracted when you start looking at these other programs, which 
I love the way you put it. It's when you get to a point of self-actualization at a company, as a startup, it's pure survival. You're not worrying about this right now, right? Yeah. You know, it's I just agree, like- But at some point, but that point is not when you first get your- No, your I mean, look at our families. Look, bo- you know, both of our families and ancestors came from war-torn areas. I don't think our, I don't think you and I would have been, would have made it and been living right now had our, you know, either our parents or great, great grandparents or, or whoever it might have been, been worrying about self-actualization before worrying about like, how am I going to eat and sleep and, you know, find water, you know? Uh, my grandfather um, swam across the Danube carrying rifles. No shit. Against Germany. Wow. You know? So, I mean, I don't think he was worried too much around, you know, anything else, but living and so it's uh you know i i think some ways we're we've become in many ways a soft you know a soft country um around these issues we're very privileged from you know a lot of people doing a lot of really really hard work um i don't want us to regress you know i don't want us to and it's good that we can be you know that's why a lot of people want to come here and so i think that's awesome you know in fact you know, how did Tom say it? He goes, you know, we should be stapling a green card onto every, you know, every student from outside the country. You know, we should be stapling, you know, stapling a green card to their, to their, um, their, their, no. their graduation certificate. No, but, and but I believe in that wholeheartedly. Yeah, I know, but you're absolutely right. And again, like, I'm, I'm not, you know, um, on, on one side, I'm not, I'm not like, even though I am from Texas, you know, so I'm not like, <laughs> 100% like America for everything, but, you know, <laughs> but I will say that, and I, I tell, and, you know, having, I've been blessed to have a great wife, but having a wife who immigrated here, right, so I'm having to sort of, uh, like, get her used to the culture, and, you know, and she, and, and teach her things, and I have to tell her, like, you know, as an American, this is what we do, this is what we don't, and I think part of it is that with, you know, so I'm an older millennial, I'm 30, 30, 34, but with my generation, the ones below, I think it's important that we talk about these things, because, you can't take it for granted that like, yeah, this is the greatest country on planet earth and, and we're very powerful, but that, that can be taken away very, very quickly if we lose focus, you know, and there's a lot of countries around the world that are gunning for us all the time. And right now, the only thing, in my opinion, that is kind of saving us is that we happen to have some of the best companies and the best universities in the world. That, so people want to naturally come here, but I mean, there's a reason why China's uh, competing with us uh, very, very competitively right now. The same thing with India, right? And so we have to keep that in mind. And part of that is, you know, I don't know. Some of the things I see people uh, get into arguments about, whether it's on Twitter or in, in public or whatever, it's indicative of a very, very good and, 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 and successful country. Because if, like, if, that's what, if you can spend time like arguing about things like that, you live a really good life, but at the same time, it's like, you know, soft times will, will make soft people. And those soft people are going to end up bringing about hard times, you know? Um, Well, I'm very appreciative of the country. Um, and the, you know, we have our, we have our pros and cons like everyone, Um, but I've been to many countries and I, um, and many are beautiful. Um, but not are all beautiful politically or, you know, from the standpoint of, of the ability to do the like startups. I mean, the, the really great thing Absolutely. that we have is this. It's that's a, and I was telling my wife this day. My wife is a, is a, um, she has a <laughs> Instagram handle called food with Kim and, and we're, she's very passionate about nutrition and cooking. I told her, I said, look, one of the great things about this country, you can be whoever the hell you want. You can make as much money as you want. Nobody's going to bother you. And if you go to, let's say, certain areas of Europe, I mean, it is a really difficult and very expensive just to start a business, right? You can be yeah. 18 years old, 19 years old, and just say, you know, I'm going to start an LLC and just on the side, try and like make a little money, right? This is this is the land of opportunity for the reason, you know? Um, and I hope we keep it that way. Well, I, I'm really appreciative of when I was an exchange student, you know? It's, where, um, where were you as an exchange student? What, were, it, what was a big eye-opening thing? Because that's like a life transforming thing when you go overseas for the first time. So this was actually in South America, well, Central America and uh, Mexico. So Panama, <clears throat> and um, and then I had an exchange student live with us from Costa Rica when I was. So um, in Panama, Noriega was still in charge. So it um, that was kind of eye opening, and sort of the the Panamanians hatred of Americans. Um, I got to be the recipient of being a minority. 
um, you know, people trying to beat me up or hurt me or whatever, simply because I was an American. I was, and I went to a Panamanian school. I didn't go to an American school. Um, and in Mexico, um, well, Mexico was fine. I mean, it, it was, um, you know, I, I just, I became very, I'm still very good friends with my, um, with both those families that I live with. And I think if everybody could go do that, if you could go live in another country, you'd be a lot more open to, um, to these other cultures and to other people because they're all just like us. They want the same thing. They want to raise a family. They want to live in a stable environment. They, you know, all those things we all want, regardless of your religion, your race, whatever it is, we all just want the same damn thing. And yeah. so it's, it, 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 we, we, if more kids had that opportunity um, to do it, I was very fortunate. I, I worked at Taco Bell and, and, um, and, uh, and my newspaper route to pay for my my trip so um and i was very fortunate to do that too you know that i got that i got to you know pay for it so it um i i don't know i i those things shape your life right those 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 foundational moments of your childhood that uh shape my my thinking around how we you know how we think about other countries and cultures etc so, but I do, I do appreciate the fact that we are able to, you know, we're, we are the startup capital of the world. You know, I, I, we, we, we foster entrepreneurialism and I don't want to lose that. I want to make sure, I think that is our, um, one of our secret sauces here, you know, and I, I think, think so our, too. Yeah. I, I totally think so too. And, you know, I, w I want to jump to the book and I said, but yeah. you know, just, just to kind of, uh, add, add to that. I think one of the things, and I didn't realize this until, you know, I worked for, um, you know, people from who, who come from different countries, um, whether it's Middle East or Asian, or anything, but something about Americans that I didn't realize until I, it, somebody pointed out to me is that we are like, by nature, we don't listen to authority. Like by nature, we literally don't care. We want to break rules. We're, we, you know, we're kind of full of ourselves. But as a result of that, we're not afraid to fail. Like we're, we're not afraid to try new things, to break the rules. And I think that's like a really, really important thing. That's like very important about being American. There's something about that, you know? And even, even when, you know, you know, this 2020 was, was a hell of a year between yeah. the protests and everything. But even in that, like, I was very proud of my country because I was like, you know what? Like, even, even as soft as, as we've become in certain ways, you know, my fellow like Americans, like they don't take shit, you know, they're willing, they're willing to fight for things. And, and even if, even though I disagree with a lot of it, sometimes I'm proud that they can do it. You know, I'm proud that I live in a country that can do that. Cause and even my wife, you know, both of us coming from Turkey can't do that there right now. No way. No, that'd no be way. problematic. No, definitely not. Yeah. So, and, and I want to, by the way, I'm, I'm good. My stakes are, are, are being sweet. They're good. You're good. I'm fine. Okay. So the wanna, audience is okay. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. Oh, they're lo they're loving this. For some reason, I don't know why they. Uh, I've gotten a few comments where they said, "Hey, like trying trying like that's why I scheduled it on a Saturday." They said, um, "Someone told me he's like, hey man, like we're talking like your podcast. The people you have on who are able to stay longer than an hour, those are the best ones because usually you've had a drink with them and it's like <laughs> starts to really get going. <laughs> but um, and in a moment, uh, I'm gonna switch." cameras just for a second just to switch batteries but it's still we're going so we're good but let's jump into the book right mm -hmm. so first of all um before i start asking you like very uh, uh <laughs> like when we start talking shop around the book there's some specific topics i really want to dive into okay but you said you were coerced into writing the book which by the way i can totally understand that because this isn't a kind of book that it's not like you wrote a bunch of blogs and strung them together like this there's a lot of frameworks and process and systems in this book like this is this is a lot of work went into this. So tell me how you were co coerced to write it. Yeah, so when we formed Wildcat, I actually wasn't part of the original couple people that, or two or three people that did it. I, um, I, knew, the P I knew the other GPs, I've known them for a while. And they invited me when they knew I was leaving <clears throat> Interwest, um, they, they invited me to become a GP. Remember, the partnerships are a strange thing, right? They're kind of like family. <laughs> it takes a while to become <laughs> a partner. This is not something you're just invited into. Um, uh, so anyway, the net it's of it- like, was, It's like um, mafia rules, right? Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. So uh, legally and otherwise, because you're jointly and, sev and severally liable for the partnership, which means somebody could do something stupid and you're, you're responsible 
financially for their stupidity. So you got to be careful about this stuff. Anyway, I had known the other partners for many years, um, investing with them or just work with them or whatever. And, um, and so I decided to join. But one of the guys um, that is a, um, not, a, not a general partner, but a, but a venture partner is a guy named Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the chasm. Yeah, I got I got to pull that out and show it everybody. Here's here's my edition, just absolutely tattered. And uh, I hate to say it, like I mean, I guess it's a good thing, but yours is definitely on the on the way. This one's about six years old. This one's only two years old, but it's it's on its way. Well, Jeff, as you know, I mean, he's he's the man, right? He's Mark. He's Mark um, Benioff's consigliere when it comes to uh, he's the strategy. Consigliere, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, a phenomenal guy, huge reputation. Business books don't sell very much. He sold millions and millions of copies. It's For still brand, too. still being taught at Harvard. And other, I mean, he's he's phenomenal. And I'm and I'm and I didn't realize that he was part of this group because I show up to this. Um, uh, we we were doing a planning session, and and Jeff was there. I went, Jeff. What, why, why are you here? He goes, well, I'm part of this team. You know, I'm not a general partner, but I'm, I'm helping with the strategy, et cetera. And so I was, I was up and I presented um, my, my thoughts around an operating and investment framework I had been developing for 10 years. Uh, you know, these concepts of what I had learned, um, both as an operating exec and also as an investor. And I'm, I'm kind of a framework guy, just like Jeff. And so I put all this together and he said, you, you, you need, you have to write a book about this. I said, he goes, there's no, it's answer, but this is really good work. Um, we need to, we need to put this together. And I thought, well, as a new company, a new, a new firm, we need something to hang our hat on something that differentiates wildcat venture partners from every other venture capital group. And, you know, I mean, Sequoia, I mean, these are iconic names, right? We're nobody. Um, now, Wildcat, um, we happen to come up with as a way to talk about um, digital oil. So Wildcatters were digital the- Digital oil. Yeah, so Wildcatters were the, um, they used um, statistics to decide where to drill for oil. And so today, uh -huh. uh, Wildcat, well, is basically, and if you look at the eye in Wildcat, I was, I was just, yeah. And let me, let me show people who are watching this on YouTube, as you can see that. Yeah. So that's okay. So that's, I was always, and I don't know why I never asked Graham, like why the name Wildcat? Well, you remember the, do you ever watch Flintstones cartoons? Did you I ever used to watch them a lot, but there was, okay. I don't know if it's, it's from the Win Flintstones. Yeah. I, well, at the opening session, there is this thing where the they go to a drive-in and, and they throw this thing, this big thing onto the guys, onto their car, and it turns the car over. It's, I remember. I didn't. I had no idea yeah. what that was. And many years later, I realized it was like a giant set of brontosaurus ribs or something like that. Yeah. And I and so in our family, we go when it's an aha moment, an epiphany, we go aha ribs. That's the, and so. For, I like that. So the the drill bit ribs the drill bit wildcat wildcatters digital oil so that's how that all comes together as a brand and so i decided to use dig, you know this concept of digital oil and and uh, investing in companies um, that allow you to um to identify mine and monetize digital oil and invest in those companies and to use these principles that i had developed i had i didn't call them traction gap at the time um, but these principles around how do you identify something that has yet to be identified? How do you, if you, how do you invest in a company that has no customers, no code? And, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, I've had five companies that were ideas that have gone on to be multi-billion dollar outcomes. Now, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the best investor. But that I didn't happen by accident either. If it's one or two, that's one thing. But if it's five, there, there, there was some sort of approach. There's an approach. And I said, well, and that's what Jeff said. He, go, he said, look, your, your, the proof is in the, is, is the evidence of the outcome. And so you need to document this because if you can show entrepreneurs that you have a, this is not, you know, I, I don't want to go off the, uh, over the rails on this thing about, oh, if you do everything that I talk about in the book, you will become a billion dollar plus success. No way. But if you want to give yourself a better than even shot 
That's a it. really good way to legally get yourself out of that. <laughs> yeah, no, but, better but, than you. but complete. And 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 yeah, please finish finish it because I I wanted to show you something regarding that. I'll just say you know I he said you, you need to you need to write this down and and I said okay well I don't want this to be some bullshit marketing book like you talked about earlier. I I want it to be I want it to be prescriptive. I read these marketing books and I read about how great it was for someone else, but how do I apply that stuff to me? What are the metrics? What should I be looking at? At what point in time in the company? What are the key things to be thinking about? measurements, et cetera. And so I wrote this with a whole set of <clears throat> metrics that you can use to be able to gauge yourself, where am I against the, the companies that have gone on to become successful? And remember, I'm a, I'm a B2B software as a service investor. So I didn't write the, B, the B2C you know, book of, of all knowledge. And I'm not sure that, the, I mean, the B2C book of all knowledge. I didn't, and I, the B2B book of all knowledge has yet to be written too. But, but I wanted to give people um, a, a way to analyze where are we, what do we need to do? And, I, and, I, and to me, you have to create taxonomies, metrics, and a simple way to understand and have a, a dialogue across the team and with your investors <clears throat> as to where you are. And so the concepts of product, revenue, team, and systems those are kind of the four foundational organic principles. Those elements stay with you through the, from formation into perpetuity. And then you wanna say, well, what becomes more important at different stages? And I said, well, how do I define different stages? Well, Steve Blank um, and about Eric Reese uh, and Dries, they all came up with minimum viable product. And I said, well, people kind of know what that is. So why don't I create a few minimum viable ideas um, that we can use? And people then will go, okay, I grok what MVP is. Maybe they'll grok what MVR, minimum viable repeatability or mm -hmm. minimum viable traction. And then I put metrics against that and what you needed to do to get from one value inflection point to the next. Why do I say value inflection point? Well, because if you can reach that point, that next point on the capital you have, you will reduce risk and improve the likelihood of the next investor investing you. What do I mean by next investor? Different investors sit at different points in the pool, in the swimming pool. There's some that will invest right at the very beginning and they'll put a little bit of capital into you like my good friend, Eric Bond at the Hustle Fund, you know, they'll give you 50K or 100K, you know, depending upon certain factors, other people as well, you know, but different groups will invest at different points. Most of the iconic firms that you know about will not invest until this point called minimum viable repeatability. And I wanted to explain and then this. And you're scrapping the company, right? <clears throat> right. I, yep. I've, I've sold, I've built multiple products, released it multiple times. I've sold them. All. I'm beginning to convert from being a PowerPoint company into a spreadsheet company where, where I now can apply that really valuable degree from Harvard in my MBA to do some number analysis, which is perfectly fine. The issue is that prior to that, you can't really apply those principles. And this, and you know, this is the beauty about this show is that once you start drinking, things start to come full circle. <laughs> but no, but, <laughs> no but, but, but I mean, the same concept and theme that you just pointed out, which is there are certain phases to your company at where you, you focus on certain things. It's just like what we talked about earlier about companies who are focused on the top of the Maslow's hierarchy uh, 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 a needs. pyramid yeah, of needs when it comes to the self-actualization when instead they should be focusing on the foundational stuff, right? So yeah. to become a spreadsheet company and focusing on these other things, right? Which are later on when you're a spreadsheet company to get there, you have to have a good foundation and those foundations and I have it in front of me, it things like, again, the thing that I want to talk about the most minimally viable uh, uh, category, the MVP, the MVR, right? Those are the things that you have to get down as a foundation, because then though you, you're able to build off of that, right? And, and in my opinion, again, going back to like uh, to marketers, to get to a point where you're a spreadsheet marketer, where you're, where you're let's say, right, running a lot of A-B tests, you're doing a lot of growth strategies, et cetera, you have to have a good foundation. That good foundation comes from the brand side marketers, which is more focused on like the positioning, the messaging and everything. Because even though it's really simple, and I know a lot of founders who, they kind of roll their eyes like, oh, do we have to do that? It's because you have to have something to anchor to 
that you go back to where it's like, very, like something as simple as what's the mission, what's the vision and who are we selling to, right? If you don't have that down, you're going to be all over the place and you're going to be more of a wandering generality than a meaningful specific. And then as a result, like you can't really own a category for this wandering generality, right? Where one quarter you're, you're this thing, next quarter you're that thing. And you're just, you know, you, you end up burning cash and you flame out. No, I think you raise a great point. Robert. I mean, I think what I try to do in the book is to, exp- and I actually take you through an exercise that I personally had to do for two, co- well, for one company with Green Fig that um, I personally founded. Um, and so, and that um, was the, and the minimally viable category exercise. That's right. Correct? MVC and minimum viable category. So if you try to play in someone else, and I thought that, that Christopher Lockhead and that team that wrote that book play bigger, phenomenal. I, I think that he, that, that is just a great book for everyone. Everybody should read this book. Go. So, um, the, the concepts in there are right on, which is if you try to play in someone else's um, category, there you try to you try to participate in you know um, to to storm their castle, you are screwed. You need to create a different castle, and so the way you do that is through language. The way you do that, and this is what what maybe my mom was a, an English professor, so that maybe this is where this really came into in into you know into play here, which is. You, you need to look for really interesting concepts. And these are thought leadership concepts. By the way, thought leadership terms don't really belong on your website. No one's searching for your really interesting. I didn't write about this in the book, but I'll tell you here now. So this is a, this is a freebie. The, um, you, have to, you have to separate thought leadership terms from sales terms. People mm. are searching for things that they already know. When you go to a conference and you speak or you write a book, that's the time to introduce thought leadership terms, interesting new vernacular, interesting new ideas. But unfortunately, no one's really looking for those things on the internet. So your website has to actually have current terms that can be picked up in SEO. So, and nobody goes to a conference to buy something. They go there to learn something. Mm -hmm. So teach at the conference and sell on your website. So you can have a little bit of mixture of the two and that's where a book comes handy or those kinds of things that you can sell, but do not conflate those two issues. You need to make sure that you have a division of of thought that, that, and you actively think about what are the terms. So when I thought about Green Fig, as a microeducation company teaching applied business science. Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. What is that, Bruce? You know, I'm given an opportunity to explain. Well, micro means small and applied business science. Well, business science is something different. That means not creating Marketo or creating Salesforce, but learning how to apply a sales a CRM system or a marketing automation system in real life. So we don't teach you necessarily how to operate Marketo, but we do teach you how to, what are the CTAs, what are the call to actions, Mm -hmm. or what should be the territories for your sales. We teach those things that Salesforce and Marketo don't teach you. So you have to come up with vernacular that's interesting. You have to become, to become a thought leader, you need to introduce interesting concepts that others have not thought about before. And so like Tom, when he wrote his book about digital transformation, he equated it to biology, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, well, how many people here, you probably know, but how many people here listening know what punctuated equilibrium is? Go read about it. I'm not going to tell you what it is here, but it's a really interesting concept. And he equates it to what's happening in technology and in companies and why the wipeout, why 52% of all Fortune 500 companies that existed in, in 2000 no longer exist were completely obliterated from the face of the planet, like the dinosaurs and like others. So punctuated equilibrium, really cool biologic term applied for technology. My CEO is a phenomenal market engineer. He knows how to do this. I don't have to teach him anything. I learned you know, most of what I know from isn't him. That, isn't, that, isn't that great that you have a, that you have a CEO like that? Yeah. Right? He's, I think I've, I've been lucky to have the majority of my career, I've had uh, CEOs who understand and appreciate marketing. So I've never had to, like really go full force on my persuasion 
but my heart goes out to the marketers who have CEOs who don't see that. But part of that, that's, I think marketing has gotten a bad rap and, and the big thing about it. So like a little, I never got to tell you that I, I, I told myself, I said, one day I'll, I'll talk to Bruce and Thomas. So back in 2015, when I was, I was, I mean, I'm still in my opinion, like I'm, I'm, I'm not a somebody yet, but back then I was really nobody. I was just a kid and I was living in Orlando, Florida, and I was trying to get out here to the Valley. And the only thing I can think of was, Hey, I have all these ideas. I have the, all these strategies, but why should I wait for an interview for somebody to discover this? I should just put it out there for the market. So I started writing these articles. And one of these articles that was my first viral hit was about digital surgery and robotics. And I talked, I didn't call it category design, but I talked about this one company where if they created a new category, right, they would suck all the other companies in that the dumb thing that they should that they would do is to go and try and be a surgical robotic company they should go and be a digital surgery company which they talked about they kind of messed this up i mean verb for anybody who's from verb surgical i'm sorry you know i love you guys but like it's kind of the truth you know but they could have done this that so i wrote that back in 20 2015 then in 2019 i come across your book and the first thing i read about it is minimally viable category and i'm like oh my god like that's it the thing that I thought about, I just didn't know how to articulate, you articulated in this book. And of course, like I went and read the, you know, Play Bigger. And it was just so funny how all these things are connected. By the way, Play Bigger is a fantastic book. I love it, but you're going to laugh at this. Pages 72 to 76, those are the pages you talked about, the minimally viable category uh, uh, um, exercise. And I only memorize it because A, I pointed people to that those pages so many times. And B, I, I love the, the people from Play Bigger. I think you did a better job explaining that ex that that exercise in your book. I'm just gonna put that out there, you know. <laughs> I don't think that Chris and the other guy, Christopher and the other guys, necessarily set out to write a prescriptive book. I think what no, they you're to, right. That's the thing. Want to change your your thinking, and yeah. I had that benefit, right? I could build on their on on top of their um, really, uh, you know, I think um, mind mind changing concept. Yeah. And they published their book, let me see, back in, let's see. So theirs was 2016, yours was 2019. So they, you had time for that idea to marinate and flush it out a little yeah. bit. So that yeah. makes that makes complete but, sense. I mean, it's, it's, you know, like in mathematics or anything, we build on the, the, the sedimentary layers of others, right? And so I, um, I had the benefit of thought of being able to read their book and say, well, how could I, how could I tell somebody, what should you go do? You know, and I and, and everything I wrote in the book, you know, and you know, one per, I got a really negative review. So you know, I mean, you put yourself out there, you're not going to get all roses. So. You got a negative got, review on your book? Yeah. Oh, so that was, was that means it was a good book. Here's the thing: I, 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 I this is a book show, obviously. Yeah. If you if you have a if you're a published author and you don't have any negative reviews on Amazon, it's not a good book. I, I think it wasn't good, but you have to have some bad reviews. You do. Somebody said I never read so many three-letter acronyms in my life, and, and I went. <laughs> that's and I that's went, not that's not a negative review. <laughs> and I went. Well, I tried to I tried to minimize the number of those things to, and and only introduce a few, but it was too many for him. So that's fine. Um, but I do believe, and, and in fact, I would argue that the other work I did was in the resource tab under tractiongap.com. If you go there, there's like a paywall. They want your name, but yeah, it's, please it's go a good fill resource it out. Tab. They won't spam you. Please go fill it out and get the infographics that come with that. It, I, I got them right the here. <laughs> there you go. All the metrics in the book are put into there and I demanded that we do this. And in fact, I would give the damn book away for free if it weren't for the Amazon and others. You know, this is more around Bruce's legacy contribution to entrepreneurs. I'm not gonna make a dime from this book. So, and neither <laughs> is Wildcat. So I think we spent a quarter million dollars, all the research and everything on it. We will never get that back. That's not the purpose. Buy the Kindle version, pay, you know, no. I would send you copies. <laughs> Let me hear you. Let me, let me, well, I, I have a, I have another question. Actually, before I remember the quote, I have to say something about, about another theory I have about to why you write the book. But so I, you actually, when I first met you, this is back in, uh, this is back in 2019, I got you to sign the book. 
I don't know what the hell you wrote, and I'm hoping that you can help me decipher this. <laughs> That's because my handwriting sucks. Yeah, well, your handwriting is like mine. It's it's like chicken me, scratch mixed with calligraphy. I'll but bring I'm, it up I'm, there and let me see what I wrote. Before I show you, here's what I think it says. Uh -huh. I think it says either here's to becoming a, a money everything or here's to becoming a monkey entrepreneur. That I can't tell if it's one or the other, but tell us what it is. You, here's to becoming... A market engineer. Oh, market engineer. Okay. <laughs> this is why. This is but you why. know, I, I thought, you know, here's to becoming a money everything. That sounds pretty good. I like that. A money everything. Yeah. Market engineer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think so. Just to um, pay homage to your, to your, to your work here. I think I can, I can point to one company where I got to do that. Uh, Petrero Medical, which was a, um, it's a, it's a medical device company with a, with a critical care monitor and a Foley catheter. It's not really exciting, but it's a data company, right? An AI company. And when I started there back in 2018, yeah, 2018 or, tw yeah, 2018, 2018, um, I asked the CEO, Joe Urban, who's like, a, he's a unicorn of a CEO, bro, uh, phenomenal leader. I said, hey, for us to start rebranding this company, take it to the next step, we have to own a category. What category do you want us to own? And I said, we should make one up and be the first to own it. And he said, predictive health. Predictive health has always been around, but it's never been anything that anyone branded against. So if you search on Google these days, you look up predictive health, like the Pentagon came up with a predictive health center. There's like groups on predictive health. <coughs> that literally spawned from me and Joe Urban putting this together and, and doing what they talked about in Play Bigger, which is marketing the brand, the product, and the category simultaneously, aggressively. Um, so thank you very much for writing this book because that actually inspired my work there and it's inspiring my work now at my new company, Gen 10 Health. And your mic drop moment, by the way, was when you commented on my posts on LinkedIn and you said, you know, look up enterprise AI, it's a thing. Not only is it a thing, there's an enterprise AI publication. <laughs> and I think that's like, that's like when, when you know you did a really good job as a market engineer, it's not only that Google search is populated with all these search results, but there's a publication on the category that you engineered. <laughs> you, you know, the really interesting, so what I, um, so you asked me, hey, how come you made that change, right? How come you came to Tom? This yeah. is a great segue. So I'm sitting, so my home, I'm actually sitting in Pleasanton right now. Um, this is where my children and grandchildren live. I have a little apartment here that, that we keep, um, as well as one in Redwood City. But our actual house right now is in Bend, Oregon. But, and I don't get to be there very often. But I was um, back in October of 2019. And I'm sitting there, I'm submitting my, my final exam. Well, actually, it's November. My, um, my final exam for, um, I... I, I went back to school at Johns Hopkins and, um, oh, and so, Hopkins too. Well, which is a pretty, yeah, pretty decent school, right? Very, and, very decent school for sure. And so I submitted, I was really enjoying it because I had time in venture to be able to do that. And, um, you know, and I'm finally, you know, actually a good student. So, and I, I'm looking out after just sitting, I go, so Bruce, I'm looking out of the Cascade range, which is beautiful looking out at in Bend. And I don't know if you've ever been there, maybe your audience, some have been, it's gorgeous. And so I'm looking at it at the, um, the seven peaks at, at uh, Broken Top and Bachelor, and these are all volcanic peaks with snow, gorgeous. And uh, I said, so is this how you're going to end your career? This, this is it? This is, you're going you're gonna to sit passively on the sidelines of one of the most interesting technology transitions to have ever occurred in your four decades. You're going to really do that. And I thought, you're going to let somebody, some other entrepreneurs, you know, go on. I said, you know, you wrote a book around market engineering. Why don't you put it to the test? Do you still have the metal to do this? Woo! So I called Tom Siebel, CEO of C3AI. I called him up that night, probably after two of these, I bet. There um, we so, go. And so I said, I called him, I said, Tom, I think I'm ready to, and he had talked to me a few years earlier about potentially, you know, coming to work there. Um, I've been an investor. I was in early, I was at his house when we created the company. So, I mean, this is one of those early stage things and I've been an advisor. And so I called him, I said, Hey Tom, I'm thinking about reentering. I said, you know, maybe there's something for me to do. I don't know, product manager. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. I just, 
you know, to be in. He, he said, I love how humble you are that, that, that you're deciding that after being a, a, in VC, a VC that you're like, I'll go be a product manager. I, I mean, whatever, you know, play between the white lines, you know, whatever you need me for coach, you know, so, and I'm 62, I'm not 25. So, you know, maybe there isn't a role for me. So I, I call him up. And um, he didn't, he didn't answer that. He, he gave me a call the next morning. He said, he goes, he starts off. The first thing he says, I'm listening. <laughs> and I, went, <laughs> and I went, I said, well, okay. I, um, I said, I don't think I want to do venture. I said, I think I want to end my career the way it began with you. I, I think, you know, maybe there's a way for me to add value to C3 AI. And so he said, well, when can you be here? I said, well, I could be there on Monday. It was Friday. I said, I'll be there on Monday. So I came in at 11 and 12, I was CMO of the company. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty interesting change. And uh, he said, he goes, what I want you to do for me is I want you to engineer the category of enterprise AI. Enterprise AI. He said, you know, look it up. There's nowhere, nothing. He said, I want you to put it where you And I said, okay, I'm going to put together, I'm going to take all the things. I didn't say this about my book. Um, I just said, okay, fine. I said, I'm going to, I will put to work all the things I've learned and, um, and we're going to do it. And so we went from nowhere in enterprise AI to somewhere. I mean, we're number one in these things. And, and, you know, there it's quite, when you, when a new category emerges, there's a cacophony of, of noise, right? Different companies trying to position themselves in that space, because obviously you're not the only one that sees this stuff as being important. <clears throat> and if you are, you should be careful. Um, so the, um, the, the fact is, is that I said, well, first we have to define the category. We have to define the attributes of the category. And then we have to write the content. We have to propagate the content. We have to promote the content. And so the really cool thing was, and this is what gave me the insight into hiring all engineers into my digital marketing team. And I have a phenomenal digital marketing engineering team, people who have built digital marketing companies. So um, I said, we are going to engineer this category and we are going to take on these other companies who are trying to position themselves in enterprise AI. We have to define it and we have it. I'm not gonna go in and promote it. You know, you can go read about all this stuff on our website, but we, this is not like, we, we didn't just randomly run into this. We didn't just, like um, happen upon it. We took it upon ourselves to go through a process to do this. So I, I can unequivocally state that, that what I wrote about, we are practicing. And I, I highly encourage you, any of you that are trying to build a company, please engineer your category, come up with your, give your CEO, if you're the CMO, give your CEO a uh, fighting chance to build this category and to own thought leadership, come up with unique concepts. What, what Chris in his book would talk about from to, from a world that looks like this to a world that looks like that because your product or services are allowing companies to do this. Conscript people into your journey and make them believers into what, into what you're doing and then to shore it up with, with truth from companies that are doing it. If you do this, I, I, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I've done this now, you know, Oracle, Marketo, Workday, Siebel Systems, C3. I mean, take a look at, at, at the stock price of AI. It's, it's, and I can't, I mean, I have an iconic CEO. I have an unfair competitive an unfair event. with him. But, but, still. But, but he gave me the tools, right? He gave me, he gives me, the, the, the freedom of operation and I explain what I'm doing and why I want to do it and I back it up with data. I've never had that at Siebel. We did not have the, I instrument everything. We know every campaign from top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. I know exactly where all the catch points are and then we solve for those catch points and we're optimizing for CTR, CPC, all that, you know, we have specific metrics and every day we look at this stuff. So you are in a unique position that I was never in. You marketers are in a great position. Digital marketing is your salvation. The fuel is the qualitative branding that we talked about earlier. The, the engine is this digital marketing machine 
that you can now you can now put to work and you, it's got a tachometer you don't we don't have idiot lights you know we have we have actual we can see all the gauges are right in front of us and we can make these tweaks you know all along the way i i am finding this to be intellectually fascinating you know to to do and i and the advantage is we're an ai company so we're actually taking all of this we, you know we have a relationship with adobe and microsoft for ai crm we're implementing the world's most foremost AI CRM um, implementation because wow. we have all that background. At least that's the that's the the goal um, is to is to eat our own dog food. Is to build a an iconic cockpit, if you will, um, for in the marketing organization on every wall around from impressions down to orders. Being able to see what's happening across every single campaign that we're running. You have this opportunity to do it as well. Um, and the technology, you don't have to go and develop it yourself. You can, you can buy a lot of it off the shelf from intent data, you know, to, to, um, to share a voice data, whatever it is. None of that stuff was available to us back in 2005 when I was last CMO. It's now completely there. And if you're not using it, you are definitely at a competitive disadvantage to your to your peers. I completely, I completely, I love everything that I just heard. I completely agree with you. And what's funny is, and I don't know, I I I I think I might be one of the few people who caught this just because again, this this show that I've been doing has been this has been every week for almost three years, and I read I read a lot of books. You know, I, I go through them like candy. And you know, when I was looking at a lot of this, you know, when you the nice thing is that when you read a lot of books and I read very broadly, psychology, history, you know, all these things, you know, I do the business books because a lot, that's usually what people are, uh, are interested in, but like, um, and actually I can pull it here. You know, the, the Bible, when it comes to marketing is these, the 22 immutable laws of marketing, right. With Alries and Jack. Al Reeves, yeah. And, and what's right, tested and proven. Well, yeah, I, exactly. And you know what's amazing? Al Reese is like 90, he's like 94 years old. He's still active. Like he's active on social media. I've sent him messages and he's like, that guy, that guy's a grinder. But this book was written back in 19, so it was back in 1993. So that's, that's a few decades ago. And when I read this, when I, I constantly read through this book, but then when, you know, it's kind of like, there's a saying that the I see what the mind is ready to comprehend right and having gone getting gotten exposed to category design from your book right then it it makes you know jeffrey moore's work so much more deeper right and then going back to here some of the key laws they talk about here they don't call it category design but like some of the laws they, they talk about like law number one like law of leadership then you have law of category law of mind law of perception law of focus all of them have they're all related to the idea of you know, and, and, and they wrote another, uh, his daughter wrote a book on branding. It all goes back to find a category, be the first there. If you can't be the first focus down that category and make it more specific to you. And the more you think, you think about this, it makes sense because even in B2B we're, we're, we're selling humans, right? We're selling to people in the C-suite. They're all individuals and, and people, the way their brains work is we don't have the capacity from a, from an energy standpoint to get into the details of these things. So we compartmentalize and categorize certain things, right? So I tell people this all the time. There's a lot of different apps. When I say streaming movies, everybody thinks of Netflix, even if they're not a Netflix user, if they use Hulu or something, it's because that's what Netflix owned as a category, right? Yeah. And I think, I think that your, your, your approach is so spot on because again, my bias here in the Valley is that there's a lot of people who want to jump right away to the spreadsheet side of marketing, running, running growth campaigns, funnels, all these things. But to do that, you have to focus first on the messaging and the brand aspect and to put a framework around it, starting with the minimally viable category. And, you know, we're running up on time. I want to be respectful of your time. A couple other questions and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. All right. You know, I think that one, one helpful thing to start is, you know, one of the slides, and I've, I've stolen this from, from your slide deck many times, you, you talk about how and when it comes to epic startup fails, there's 80% of the stars, they fail for one of two, two reasons, right? Running out of cash, which is not a surprise, but the other one is no market need. And this is where you talk about in your framework, the first thing is the MVC, which is the minimally viable category, right? 
the problem I think that people run up against, at least marketers I've talked to, is that sometimes they think they have a minimally viable category, but it's really a feature of a product. It's not exactly a category. So what are some advice, what's some advice you can give on, on thinking about a minimally viable category that you haven't put in the book yet, but you've at least come, you know, you, you've developed some insight on the last few years. Yeah. I, you know, I actually wrote a blog about this a long time ago. It's probably not, it's no longer posted. It was done in an interwest. So you said, you know, are you a, you know, are you a feature, a product, a product line, a company or a category, you know, or platform? So a lot of times I'm, I was pitched features or products. Mm -hmm. And while those are interesting, they're nothing that a venture capitalist can invest in. Right. So it's not big enough. I mean, you go, well, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea, but it, it, it will be absorbed by somebody else. Somebody else will either recreate it or they'll buy your company for very little. And so venture capital is in the business of big hits. They're not in the, in the business of singles because their model is 80% of the stuff they invest in is going to fail. So the 20% of what they, what, you know, 10% will return in capital. And it's the other 10% that has to generate huge returns to make up for all those failures. So I used to think, oh, well, venture capital would be, you know, what if I just invest in stuff, you know, that would generate, you know, two or three X multiple on deals. And it turns out, you know, the, the, the dirty secret you'll find out is that for most venture firms, for them to produce a three X fund would be huge. Hmm. You know, you think really? about NBA, very few of their funds have ever done better than two. Um, most of them are 1.8, 1.7. Now they're consistent over, you know, but they're not huge. And, but they have, they're offering a different model, a different, a different, they're offering to big giant, um, like retirement, you know, teachers unions, etc. They offer outsized returns for that group. But for the most part, venture's about returning huge, huge numbers. And it is true, some funds do. You know, you have Google in your fund, you at early stage, whatever. But the, the dirty secret is that most firms are, you know, if they can generate one and a half to two, maybe three X, that would be phenomenal. So um, you have to understand that what venture capitalists are looking for are not just a, like a good outcome, they're looking for a great outcome. And so it's gotta be a huge market opportunity. Mm. And so when I talk about it, I always, that's why I said responded in that, in that LinkedIn post, which is, Product market fit is really the wrong way to talk about it. And I'm sorry, you know, I know, I know Mark Andreessen and I know Steve Blank, they're phenomenal people. I just decided to take a different view. I said, it's not really about product market fit. It's a different concept. It's really around market product fit. Without a market for which you much engineer the market, there's no need for your product. Right. So what is that market? So when you talk about your company, you need to talk about a market opportunity that's billions and billions of people, companies, users, and, and why it is that you can install yourself as the market leader in that particular, that particular uh, group. You know, so you think about DoorDash or Uber, these aren't really, you know, this is not a, Uber isn't a transportation company. It's a, you know, and neither is Door, you know, Door. These are logistics companies, right? Exactly. You know, so it's like, it's like I tell people Tesla is not the moment you stop thinking about Tesla as an electric car company, you realize it's an energy company. It that changes the conversation. That's You're right. Correct. And so you need to think as the entrepreneur, you have to think about yourself. You go, what is it that we're really trying to build here? If I'm just trying to build a really cool product or feature in the hopes that it will catch on, okay, that might actually work, but you're probably going to be acquired. You're not going to, you're, you're unlikely to be an IPO. You're right. likely to be, and that may generate some decent, okay results for your investors, but your investors are not looking for that. Your you're investors looking, yeah. are looking for They're big looking hits. For, for home That's absolutely. the venture, right? And, and so- and I was going to say, it goes back like uh, to, to the Play Bigger group, um, you know, to get to that IPO moment, you know, they did this. The one thing I love about Play Bigger is, um, you know, they do, a, they have a lot of great data and studies. Like they really do a good job of that. And yep. they talk about the 610 rule, which is, you know, the sweet spot for these billion dollar category kings 
is when they are anywhere from six to 10 years uh, old for a company, that's when they IPO. So as a startup, you got to make it to that point because I think you're absolutely right, Bruce, because <clears throat> if you, it's product market fit is great, but I think if you hit product market fit, you might be a few hundred million dollar company exit, right? But if you look for pro market product fit, then you have an opportunity where I think that's, in my opinion, I think that's kind of what Tesla did, right? If they looked for product market fit, they would have been just like another electric car company. I think you're right. But because they, they went with the market product fit. They started with like the high-end electric cars, right, for, the, for luxury. But because they owned the hell out of it and did a really good job, they started expanding to everything. And so now you talk to anybody, just the average Joe in the street, you say electric car, they're not going to think about Toyota or GM or they're going to think of Tesla. That's right. right. It's, you have to engineer a market. You have to install yourself as a category king. You have to do that through thought leadership. You have to write the books, go to the conferences, talk different. You know, what, what Steve Jobs said many, many years ago, think different, speak different. You need to speak different. You need to go, wow, that was an idea I hadn't thought of before. That's a concept. People will listen to that. Smart people will listen to that. And so when we talked about digital transformation, that wasn't a concept that we came up with. That was a concept that Tom heard about from talking to hundreds and hundreds of CEOs and said, wow, this is pretty interesting. So we're not creating the digital transformation category. We created the enterprise AI category that allows companies to digitally transform. Mm. So it's a, you really, you know, this is, this is where art and science come together. Exactly. And, and, and it requires, it, this is, words matter. You know, lawyers would tell you words matter, right? Um, marketers, words matter. Don't use the same garbage language that everyone else is using, please. I, absolutely. And I tell this to people, and it's funny how so many things, and this is why I tell people, I was like, you know, when it comes to reading, I, of course, like given the show, I get so many requests about what should I read? And I tell people, I'm like, read very, very broadly. The books that Adley actually made me a better business person, they're not business books. The books that actually made me a better leader, better business person, books on history, books and religious texts, things that are tried and true. And what's interesting is you, you kind of summed up what I, was, what I was sort of pointing out earlier about those two different types of marketers, that the ideal marketer is able to combine both the science and art together, right? That's Absolutely. kind of like what's needed because again, I think we're very, we all are aware of like the, the, the marketers are like too, too artistic, but the scientific marketers, while they're very good at experimentation and everything, a lot of times I'll look at certain experiments uh, you know, certain strategies or tactics. And I, and I tell people, I'm like, you know, you're testing for something, but this could have been solved just if, if you knew how to copyright the right way, you know, if you knew how to use certain use words the right way. Right. And, and I think that it's, it's so interesting, Bruce, that you said that about, you know, you know, thought leadership stems from using new language, right language, right. Because, you know, talking, you know, to get like a little patriotic, that's why the first amendment is so important in this country. Right. And I was explaining this to my wife is that the reason why that's so important in this country and it's so unique is because for the human mind to 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 generate thoughts, you have to articulate, you have to speak them. Right. And if you're able to control what someone could say, you can technically control what they get to think, you know. And so Absolutely. I think that coming up with with and I that's the first time I heard it is when you said it, not only a category, but essentially a, voca a vocabulary. Um, of, of new words to use, because essentially that's what's needed to start articulating new thoughts. Is that, is that correct? Am I right? Yeah. Like and, and remember what I said earlier, which is don't use those words on your website per se, they can be there, but you're never going to show up in SEO. So you do want to use the words that are being thrown around by industry that are generally accepted. But the truth is that thought leadership is reserved for conferences and books and for your CEO and others to introduce new ideas, but your website is kind of a retail storefront. And so consequently, you have to, you still have to use language that people already know and then run into your language, you know? So make sure, don't try to just populate your website with all your great ideas. You know, that's- um, No one's gonna you know, find it. You're absolutely yeah. right. And so that, that's a mistake that I see a lot of, a lot of people make the other, you know, the other pet peeve I have now become, you know, now that I'm, now there I'm, were a few drinks in <laughs> yeah, now that, yeah, a pet peeve I have is 
all of this email that I get that is just garbage. It's like, <laughs> you, like you have this problem. No, I don't have a lead gen problem, dude. You know, I mean, I don't have that problem. I don't, I don't, I don't have that problem. I don't have a lead gen problem in my company. I, we have lots of great leads. I have a different set of problems. So don't assume anything from you, the people you're, and do not let your salespeople write these damn emails. Oh my God, stop that. You know, please give them intelligent things to say so that way they can say them. You know, and, and I'm not their buddy. I'm not their pal. I have two seconds to take a look at what you have to say, or I'm blocking you forever. You will never be able to reach me again. So what is it that you want to try to ask me? Or what kind of insight do you want to provide? And don't say that. I'd never start your email with, you have this issue. Because no, I don't and goodbye so please let's get better as a as a as a industry as as a as a function as marketers let's get really good about figuring out how do we when we write these things because they're important i mean they land on my stuff i do respond to, to some but i respond to the ones that are intelligently written that don't poke me in the chest about what i'm not doing because i'm actually fine um, that actually hit upon a problem. And if I have, if I, it's actually an issue that I have and I, I may put it aside and keep it in a folder for when I can get to it. Cause I'm really freaking busy. But if you piss me off by saying I have some problem that I don't have, you'll never reach me again. So absolutely. I, I just, you know, email is a horror is a, is a weapon of mass destruction of brand. It, it, <laughs> so, you know, it really because it's so easy it's so easy and yeah you know i tell people <clears throat> a lot of times and again i'm 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 just i'm just a i'm a i'm a boy from a small city in texas out mm -hmm. here in silicon valley but i i hear you know i'll give some suggestions for certain things because my my thing is that you know there's certain things to, that you can do that'll enhance your ability to sell right you know, get, you know, spend some time. And this is what HubSpot and Mark Roberge did like in the early days, which is like, hey, spend some time in the places where your customers are already at and engage with them. And it'll be easier to sell them. And I love hearing this, this comment. It just drives me. It's like, oh, but Omar, Omar, but that, you know, that doesn't scale. I'm like, well, no shit. No, it doesn't scale, but that's why it works. That's why it works. And I think a lot of these things, like it's great to have email marketing, all these automation tools and everything. But the thing is that everybody else is using them. So if everybody else is using it, right, there's a lot of noise to cut through, which means you have to really elevate, again, in these simple things like language and copywriting. How many marketers do you know off the top of your head who, who you can say like, not, not that, yeah, they can write, but they, they can actually qualify as a good copywriter. It's not a lot. No. Right? It's not a lot. Lost art. It is yeah. a lost art. But I'm I'm, I'm I'm keeping it all, I'm keeping it alive. I will recommend you know, and we're gonna again, uh, Bruce. Right. Thank you so much for being like, yeah. So for 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 staying on, we we're gonna wrap up with sort of some rapid fire questions, and we'll, okay. we'll end the night. Um, right. Definitely. I mean, I don't even have to hear back from my audience. I'll wait to hear from them. But you're probably you're most definitely gonna be asked to be back on. This was fantastic. But I will say this for everybody listening. Um, on on the on the side of copywriting, you know, check the YouTube channel. The best books on copywriting are these old 30, 40, 50, 60 year old books on, on copywriting, specifically one by Eugene Schwartz called Breakthrough Advertising. It's no longer published. It's $200 to, to buy it. it. You know, it's sometimes going for 500. It's worth every penny. I'm just going to say that to everyone. So Bruce, to wrap up, we're going to go into some rapid fire questions. Now with this, you can take as long as you want to answer this question, right? But the faster you answer, the faster I'll get to the next one. We'll go. We'll do a few of these. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, great. So, first question: What is the book that you most often gift to other people? Gift or recommend? Can't be your own book, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I mean I would say it's 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 Jeffrey's book, Crossing the Chasm. It's just iconic. Um, it's a foundational piece of literature for the, for the B2B marketer. And that's the one that I most highly recommend if we're talking about, you know, B2B marketing. Very good. What, um, next question, what is the most painful, painful, but yet memorable thing a mentor has ever told you? And how did that change you? That what I had to say had absolutely no 
uh, of, was of no importance to him. How did so that how change did you? Change me? Yeah, yeah. It made me realize that in in venture capital, you need to walk a very fine line. You're not the operating executive, and you need to understand while your money is invested in there, um, that the people who you're working with have to actually do the work. And mm -hmm. so it reminded me that, um, or taught me, and I, I never made that mistake again. And it taught me that, um, that I need to be very careful about my, my recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and speak more like Alex Trebek used to speak, which is in the form of a question. Very good advice. I like that. A okay, couple, couple more. So let's pretend for the next year, um, and let's. I'm I'm gonna let you choose uh, who the audience is, but let's say for the next year you had a billboard, and you can take out any message you want of this billboard. It's gonna be all over the Mer all over the America, and and this target audience or target group of people, they're gonna see it every single day that they you know wake up, going to work, whatever it might be. The audience can either be people in venture or people or, or entrepreneurs. So I'm going to let you choose who you want that message to be. What would that message on that billboard say? Do something great. Do something great. And that can mean in, in any size, shape or form, you know, teach somebody something, build a new company, take on, you know, if you're, if you are a teacher in a public school, do something that isn't considered to be part of the norm. I mean, the only way we're going to succeed as a society and continue is to is to do something great, like the founding fathers. You know, take a risk, do something great. Absolutely, absolutely. And I guess my last question to you is, um, you know, twenty twenty was was a hell of a year. I know it was a very hard year for a lot of Americans. My heart goes out to them. I made sure to make sure that even though it was a tough year, it was one of my best years. A lot of great things came out of it. What was the biggest lesson that came out of uh, 2020 for you and your family? Um, I think communication, communicate, being um, overly communicative with, you know, with, with my children and grandchildren, you know, it's pretty lonely, mm -hmm. right? In, in, and each family can be pretty well isolated. And this applies to my team, our team and our company, which is people had to operate. There's people on my group, in my group that I've never personally met that you know, they, they joined, but they joined in this format. I see them weekly, but I've never personally met them. So I think that, I think the, um, you can't, I don't believe you can over communicate. And so I think that makes, we're humans and we need, we need to make sure that people know that we care about them, that, that we understand the issues that they're going through. And while we can't always solve all those problems, we can certainly be empathetic and sympathetic to those issues. And so that takes a different form with family than it does necessarily with your teams and your, your companies. Mm -hmm. But I think by, by maintaining that perspective, understanding that, you know, it's, it's okay to, to, you know, we use teams, we don't use zoom, but you know, we, we have these teams calls and I try to communicate with, with my, with the people in, on my team daily. And I, I, and I think we should never retreat from that. I, I'm not sure we're going to go back to the way it was pre-pandemic. We know a lot of people may never, they, we may end up with work from wherever, right? Um, as, a, as a go forward method. But I think that introduces lots of issues around human beings. We're not you know, we're, we're tribal, right? We're, we want to, we, we need to engage with each other. And I think we can, we can lose that. I, I, I suggest that we not lose that. It's kind of like when you drive on the freeway and, and somebody feels like it's okay for them to cut you off because they don't know you, they don't have to talk to you. You know, they, they just have that metal thing that comes in between you. And I think this is a digital metal thing. You know, it's easy to become really, really um, distant from from our from our human being friends and family and others so don't let that happen absolutely
if I can't think of a better way to wrap up, you know, Bruce, thanks, thanks again for jumping on and having a few drinks with us. It was great. So everyone, you know, uh, Bruce's book, Traversing the Traction Gap, again, I'm leaving it in the comments and Bruce, he, I believe you're on LinkedIn and Twitter. So I'll be sure to leave your handle on there. And for uh, those of you who are entrepreneurs uh, listening to this, um, Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong. If you decide to pitch Bruce anything, make sure you read this book first <laughs> before you talk to him. Because I feel like this is also a fantastic, uh, like a paywall where it's like, if you're going to pitch me anything about your startup, please just read this book. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, if, you're, if you are serious about doing something, you know, I would suggest you might want to learn those things. Otherwise, I don't want to spend the 45 minutes reciting what the traction gap is. You know, it'd be better to learn more around what are you doing and why are you doing it and how does it relate to these concepts? I'm not really, I'm not as much in that business right now, but my partners are, and they're really, they are former operating people too. Yeah. Do, you know, do yourself a favor, read the books um, because it, one, you'll engage at a higher level. You'll get more out of the hour um, than you would if you just come in raw. Um, and I think that's good advice. Fantastic. Well, awesome. Well, Bruce, stick around just for a second. Thank all you right, all right. for listening. And uh, we'll definitely be having Bruce back on again soon. All right. We'll see you all later. Take care.